Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to begin a new series of videos today over the five proofs of the existence of God. This is a response to a patron's request and is a part of the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So the five proofs of the existence of God, what is that? Well, in one sense, it is quite literally the book that I am holding in my hand, written by a guy named Edward Fazer. Um, somebody whom I had not read before this book was recommended to me by this patron, uh, somebody who I really have to recommend it to all of you, um, in that um, he has an amazing ability to uh, communicate very sophisticated ideas dealing with a very heavy uh, duty subject matter. For example, um, in the first uh, proof for the existence of God, the Aristotelian one, which we will examine in this video, um, he defends the ideas of a uh, ancient pagan from thousands of years ago, who, by the way, is defined as the inhibition which had to be overcome in order for modern science to begin, in that if you hear the story of um, the scientific revolution, typically they say, well, the scientific revolution happened because at some point in the Renaissance, people realized that they could no longer just uh, quote verbatim from Aristotle's ancient treatise, The Physics, they had to actually go out and start experimenting and mathematically formalizing and observing, and that's how science came to be. Well, um, Phaser shows that um, Aristotle's proof for the existence of God, no less, can still be defended in light of the most recent um, findings within, say, quantum physics. Now, that's a pretty heavy-duty subject matter, but he's able to communicate this in a way which, um, once again, pretty much anybody can understand, um, and also in a way that is so interesting that this book is a real page-turner. I basically read the whole book um, while riding on a 13-hour-long train uh, from Northern Kerala to Southern Kerala. Um, not exactly the easiest place to be thinking about heavy-duty stuff from, say, physics or something like that, but um, he, he still makes it so interesting that I really cannot recommend this guy enough, and um, the proof themselves, well, basically the other sense of the term, the five proofs of the existence of God, beyond the title of a book, the proofs themselves are associated with the five figures you see on the cover of this book. They are Aristotle, then the Neoplatonist uh, Platon, uh, Plotinus, and try to give something like the Latin pronunciation, um, and then Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and Leibniz. The interesting thing about this book is that um, even though it's about the five thinkers you see on the cover, it is not as I myself had expected, um, something that kind of walks you through a bunch of different citations from a bunch of different texts by each one of these thinkers. Rather, Phaser found it more useful to use the same kind of thinking which each of these figures um, had used in um, his own time, but apply it to a modern context. What I mean by that is what I just said with regard to Aristotle and quantum physics. Rather than say, well, in this text, um, we find this citation, and then this text we find that citation. He does provide his references, of, of course, uh, don't get me wrong, but rather than walk you through a bunch of textual citations from Aristotle, he shows how this line of thinking is relevant in the modern era, despite the stereotypical idea that modern science is defined as nothing except the negation of Aristotle, and really all of these figures. Modern science is the negation of scholastic philosophy, right? Scholastic philosophy is the pseudo-scientific attempt to understand the entire universe. And by the way, John Michael Grew noted that um, in the medieval era, scholastic philosophy was seen, in medieval Europe anyway, as the ultimate achievement of the human intellect, precisely because it claimed to understand the whole universe, but on philosophical grounds, dealing with um, the application of the categories of, say, metaphysics from Aristotle to every possible thing, including all the way up to the ultimate thing, which is God. And you might think to yourself, um, if you've followed the very biased uh, propagandistic narrative of the historians of uh, the scientific revolution, that that was exactly what we had to stop doing in order for, um, you know, the, the revolution to happen, the scientific revolution. But um, he shows just as relevant as the Thomas Aquinas in proof, and it seems to me that uh, Aquinas is maybe his favorite one of these thinkers, as, as somebody he's also written a lot about. So um, he shows that all of this can still be defended, and also that um, the objections against these arguments, uh, especially from the kinds of clowns you find with, like, Richard Dawkins, the new atheists, um, those arguments, as emotionally compelling as they might be, 
have very serious logical problems and he does a lot of work with providing refutations to those objections which he brings up himself another method he gets basically from thomas aquinas so this is a book which once again i'd highly recommend we're going to go through each one of these um, one by one the first video today will deal with the aristotelian proof and then the other five um the, well excuse me the other four uh, videos should follow very soon this week and so as we move on now to the first proof for the existence of God, which is also the Aristotelian proof for the existence of God, this is the one which, in my own speculation, is probably the most widely known within the general population in that many people have heard something about the idea of the first mover, but it is um, something which I cannot describe as the most well-known because it, to the extent that um, people have heard about the first mover, it, it's, this is something which is all too often misunderstood, partly because of the linguistic ambiguities which uh, come up in it, the translation of that idea into modern English. For example, when we talk about movement in modern English, we're basically talking about locomotion, which is a change of a thing's location within space. But for Aristotelian philosophy, motion really just means changes of all kinds. So the first mover is more like the first changer. But there's a, a linguistic problem even uh, after you make that change because first in this sense implies analogous to movement within space being misunderstood. Well, uh, first in this context is likely thought of as involving some sort of series in time in which you have a, an understanding of the argument within the, the general population that, well, if there's a change now, it's because uh, there was um, uh, a first change all the way back somewhere within time in which another misconception in which the universe as a whole was created by something which stands outside of it. Now, this is something which it, it seems superficially to be easy to refute if you can just show that there was no beginning in time. And this is really the approach that um, Nietzsche takes uh, with his own theory of the eternal return in that the eternal return follows from the 19th century-ish idea of the materialist that um, if, the, if the amount of matter is a finite, okay, because we are materialists in which there's nothing beyond matter, all you have is the finite set of it that happens to exist, um, but as materialists we lose the possibility of creator who stands outside of it. For Nietzsche that's just the nihilism of willing nothing because your will is not strong enough to will the world that really does exist. Well, if we lose that transcendent dimension in which a first mover could exist, we will also lose a beginning to time and the inevitable result of that according to Nietzsche is that a finite amount of matter and an infinite amount of time will result in a circle in which everything that can happen um, not only will happen once but will happen an infinite number of times because um, this uh, event that we are experiencing right now is only one of many iterations on that circle of time, which by the time you get to Nietzsche is no longer the um, the comforting circle of, of say Hindu philosophy or um, or of Plato, in which you are descending down to the deep meme of the um, shape of being you already understand to have within the agrarian society to use my own philosophy. Rather, because um, Nietzsche was living within um, the fossil fuel era of the industrial revolution in the 19th century when that was kind of a done deal. Um, the idea of time as a circle is something which is literally um, capable of driving you insane, okay? And that is quite a shift, which ultimately I think goes back to mnemology. But for Phaser, this is something which, insofar as it's supposed to be a refutation of the existence of God as the first mover, here all you have to do is show that, well, time didn't have a beginning. And Phaser brings up the um, idea of the Big Bang is something which people say, well, even if there was a Big Bang, there could have been another universe before that Big Bang, which still refutes the idea that time had a beginning, and then even if you uh, posit the multiverse theory, as he explains in much greater detail um, in the book itself, even then some claim, well, that does not um, necessarily presuppose that there was a beginning to time as such. So people are doing everything they can to say that, no, 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 there was never a moment of creation. But that's something which is really kind of wasted effort. It's wasted breath when you consider the fact that for Aristotle, first in this context, actually does not have anything to do with time. So the first mover is something which cannot be understood according to the ideas 
ideas of movement or the ideas of first that we borrow both from space and time, rather Phaser will show us that something else is involved here. And this idea really can be as simple as the two word sentence change occurs. This is how he opens the chapter, by the way. And here he is once again not talking about the grand scale change of the universe from nothing into something at the Big Bang. No, no, no. There are much more modest changes which we deal with every day which can exemplify this perfectly well. For example, um, first thing in the morning, you probably like to have a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee, something which I'm um, even cats like at Garfield here love to have first thing in the morning. And the reason you like it first thing in the morning is because you know that the attributes, um, the properties of that cup of coffee will be X when it's nice and fresh, and it'll be Y a little bit later. Although, once again here, we're not so much interested in the in the, the time part of this. Rather, we know that um, the same thing can have different attributes. When um, that cup of coffee is freshly brewed, it's nice and hot. If you let it sit for too long, it'll be cold. And this is a change which um, you could set aside some other types of changes. If you use the Aristotelian categories, this is a change in quality uh, to be set aside, a change in quantity, like his own example. Um, uh, it's raining, so a puddle of water will grow ever larger as more rain is added to it. Um, then you have a substantial change. Um, going all the way to the deepest layer, you could change from one kind of thing into another kind of thing. If you swat a fly that is annoying you, it'll be it'll change from a living animal to a dead corpse. Okay, That is a change um, in the, the very kind of thing that it is no longer a fly, a living fly at that point. Um, so we have changes which we know even without this Aristotelian apparatus of categories um, how to deal with because they're just a, a, a very basic part of our everyday life. But what if we tried the Cartesian thought experiment and say, well, no, everything you think goes on within your everyday experience of the world is actually an illusion. What if there is an evil genius putting these ideas into your mind? Um, by the way, for uh, Descartes, um, etymologically speaking, genius does not mean a smart person. It really means something more like uh, the words we have, genie or jinn, is more of an evil spirit. Well, Descartes showed himself that even if the experiences of the world around you are illusions because the things, the cup of coffee, the puddle of water, the fly, they don't really exist. Even then, there would still, for, for Descartes, there would still be a mind which can be said to exist because it is the one who is um, in doubting these experiences, thinking about um, and therefore, the mind exists even if the things that it seems to be seeing don't. Um, well, for Phaser, on an Aristotelian level, this also uh, doesn't refute the idea that change occurs because if you are doubting the experiences um, to the extent that Descartes did, you are still changing something, and that is the thoughts within your own mind. You go from accepting these as real to calling them into question to going all the way over to the other extreme of dismissing them as th uh, representations of things that don't exist because the evil genius put them into my mind. Still, there's a certain kind of change um, occurring, and that is the change within your own mind. Well, the um, refutation of this supposedly from Parmenides, the pre-Socratic philosopher, was, well, even if you um, show change to be occurring within the mind and its thoughts rather than with regard to the objects out there in the world, there's still a deeper problem with this on a metaphysical level, which is that for um, Parmenides, the ultimate um, uh, formula of philosophy was that it is. And because it is, um, any idea of change entails the deeper problem of trying to posit a something coming from a nothing, but that nothing is ruled out by the very formula it is. Well, Phaser shows that there's a number of things wrong with this, um, because uh, the idea that a change such as a cup of coffee uh, growing colder can be described honestly as something coming from nothing really doesn't apply here because the cup of coffee changing from uh, being hot to being cold really is not a change of nothing into something for the coldness was within the coffee even when it was hot but it was there on a potential level. The difficulty in describing potentiality within Aristotelian terms is that it's hard to describe it as something in the same sense that the actualized hotness of that coffee is at the moment that it's still hot. So it doesn't have the same sort of isness 
um, or being that the actualized property does, but it's not nothing at the same time. For there are certain things within the coffee that potentially are there, but there are other things that are not. This must not be misunderstood as the idea that anything potentially can be within the coffee before um, something causes it to manifest itself. For there are some things which the coffee, the cup of coffee, is simply not capable of. For example, even if that cup of coffee can become cold, it can't, uh, for example, um, uh, fuel a flight from the um, uh, Earth to the Moon, is the only example that uh, Phaser provides. Um, and even though it can make me write a book by making me more awake, the cup of coffee in and of itself can't write a book. No matter what you do, that property of being able to write a book cannot be actualized within it because it was not present within it potentially in the first place. Therefore, when we talk about changes, we're more specifically talking about the actualization of something that already was potential. Therefore, Phaser favors the term the first actualizer when describing this interpretation of God over the first mover because it's just so much more specific. Now, one of the laws of metaphysics you can deduce from this is that potentiality can be actualized, but it can only be actualized by something that is itself already actual. One potentiality cannot actualize another potentiality, and therefore you have to follow the chain of actualizations even when examining something like the cup of coffee on your desk. And it's not just the series within time, by the way, the question, well, what made the coffee hot? Obviously, it was, um, if you use an electric coffee maker, it was the, the electricity that made it hot. Um, if you use the more traditional Indian coffee filter, as I do here in India, um, you don't even need um, the, uh, the, the electricity to do it. You could just boil water and then um, put it into the filter for about eight hours and you'll get nice concoction afterwards. Um, so the, the idea that um, within time you can find the actualizer within the flame or the electricity, well, you don't even need to posit that series within time to find this problem of potentiality within one thing having to be actualized by another. For um, even beyond the problem of a linear series, you have to consider the dependency of actualizations within a hierarchical series. And this is what interests Phaser a lot more. For example, that cup of coffee if it is sitting on a desk, say three feet above the ground, it is actualizing its potential to be three feet from the ground, but it's closer to the truth to say that something else is actualizing its potential to be three feet off the ground for it. And that other thing which is actualizing the cup of coffee's own potential is the desk. Well, this in turn begs the question, who is, who or what is actualizing the desk's potential to actualize the potential of the cup of coffee to be three feet off the ground? You would say, well, the floor. Well, what's actualizing that floor's potential, well, it's the foundation of the house. Well, what's actualizing that? Well, it's um, the the earth below it. And this is something which you can apply to many other examples. Even more impressive is, uh, to use his own example, the ability of a light bulb to be hanging above your head, what, six, seven feet, however tall um, your, you know the ceiling of your house might be. Well, what's actualizing that light bulb's potential to be suspended in the air? Well, it's the chain, which itself is actualized uh, by the, the thing which connects it to the ceiling and so forth and so on. So for any example you consider, even without any reference to time, you find that the potentiality of one thing is largely being actualized by another thing within a certain network in which dependency is what we care about more than any question of which came first within a series ordered over time. The problem is that this has to terminate somewhere for the very specific metaphysical reason that the ability to actualize potential is now explicitly being understood as a derivative. That is to say, um, one thing derives that actualization from another, which um, has to terminate in something which has the ability to actualize in a purely non-derivative manner. There are reasons why we can call this God. It is not only the ability to change higher order attributes such as the cup of coffee changes from cold, uh, hot to cold or the location of that light bulb changes from being on the desk before you've installed it to being hanging above your head after it's been installed. Those are um, accidental changes, but um, even beyond uh, that, we have to take into account the way that the very existence of all of those things had to be caught up in the same sort of network of 
dependencies and actualizations, which have to go back to something which must be called God, because not only is it the first actualizer, which can actualize in a non-derivative manner, it's also the first existor. It exists in a non-derivative manner, because whereas each one of us basically get our existence through a chain of dependencies like that, this one had to have already existed, and already um, existed in a way simply different from the way that all of us exist. Because insofar as any one of us lower created items exists, it is specifically because some potentiality had been transitively actualized by an efficient cause, but the first existor is one which had to have already been fully actualized and therefore had to have had no potentiality and to be incapable of the very notion of being caught up in a state of potentiality. Another reason why you would have to describe such a thing as God is that um, there could only be one of them because the very methodology we use to distinguish different uh, members of the same type of thing simply would not be applicable to this situation. And to understand that, we have to stop for a moment and consider how exactly it was that different members of the same species were understood to be differentiated from one another by people like Aristotle and also within scholastic philosophy. Now, um, Aristotle um, had a, a taxonomy of different genus and species. Uh, for example, um, the thing that we are is Homo sapiens because Homo tells us that, generally speaking, we belong to the genus of things that are hominids as opposed to some other type of animal, let alone something like a plant or an inanimate object. Okay, so we have that established, but what makes the kind of hominids we are um, different from the other types of hominids? Well, we get the species by specifying what is called the specific difference, which sapiens tells us um, that really is uh, the difference of, of reason. Sapere in Italian to this day means it's the infinitive for to know. So um, in a Greek rather than a Latin term, Terms, um, this would be um, that we are um, the animal, but the one with logos, as the formula is given by Aristotle himself in the politics. So we have now established um, the difference between the species and the genus, but that isn't enough to give us the difference between um, members of the same species. For you and I are both Homo sapiens, we are both animal with logos, but there's many differences between you and me. Well, the way that we get that is through form matter composition. We both have the same, we both came from the same essential form of Homo sapiens, or the kind of animal that has a reason, but there are many differences between you and I in accidental terms, like say, how tall are you, um, what exactly is the color of your hair, your eyes, things like that. Um, well, those are differences which result from the combination of that essential form with matter. And the differentiation between you and me might also be described in terms of privations. There are some abilities associated with the essence of humanity, like, say, eyesight, which might uh, be less than fully actualized in certain people um, who do not have the ability of eyesight, because even though eyesight is uh, present within the essence of humans, and they have the potentiality for that very reason to see for some reason or another related to the form matter composition, um, they are not able to actualize that ability. This is Aristotle's interpretation of um, birds, by the way. An ostrich is um, a really large bird which has the ability to fly because that is part of the essence of birds, is that they are flying things. The reason why an ostrich cannot fly is simply the material contingency that its wings are too small. So give an ostrich large enough wings, according to Aristotle, it can fly. Now, the way that we distinguish members of the same species from one another in terms of privations and also in terms of form matter composition simply are inapplicable to the kind of thing which is God because he by definition has no potentiality therefore he has no privations because a privation is simply a potentiality that is not fully actualized well that that's ruled out you can't distinguish him from another God on those grounds you can't also distinguish him from another God on grounds of different matter combined with the same form which ultimately is the reason for these privations because he's fully um, uh, formal rather than material because he's fully actualized rather than have any potentiality for Aristotle and Aquinas. There's an association between matter and potential and form and actuality. Therefore, you have to describe this as God because not only is there only one of them, but all of the traditional attributes of God naturally follow from exactly this definition. Such a God would be immutable or 
incapable of undergoing the kinds of changes which once again are shifts from potential to actual he would be eternal and outside of time for the same reason he would be immaterial he would be incorporeal for the reasons i've already mentioned and he would also be perfect for what is imperfection except a failure to once again actualize the potentiality um a, a person who cannot C from the Aristotelian standpoint is somebody who shows a privation specifically because a potential is there but cannot be actualized. Well, forget, you don't have any of those, therefore you don't have an imperfect person. Not, of course, to argue that blindness from a modern standpoint is an imperfection. I'm simply trying to show you the line of thinking present with the ancient thinker Aristotle. Well, if you try to apply any example of, of such an imperfection to God, they simply don't make sense. Therefore, we have the idea that such a God would also be incapable of any imperfection in the intellectual sense and therefore would be all-knowing the idea of the omniscient god is also clarified within aristotelian terminology by phaser through the idea that if we can grant that um different members of the same species like homo sapiens you and i can be instantiated through the composition of form and matter that begs the question of how the form could have quote unquote existed before any members had been composed to instantiate it. And the answer for um, Phaser really is that these forms are universal in the, the real sense of the term. There was a big debate in the last AMA about this. Well, these are really universal, okay, in a way that um, attributes are not. Uh, the, the attribute of the, the color red, uh, the quality of being hot like a cup of coffee can. Um, well, those are higher order attributes, but what's really universal are the, 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 the essential forms of the species like Homo sapiens, etc. And the question, how could they have pre-existed that process of form matter composition resulting in so many individuals of that type? Um, really can only be answered by God. And the way that they existed was in the mind or the intelligence of God. For even when you and I understand something intellectually, it is precisely through grasping the essential form of the thing beyond its matter. And this is something which we are able to do belatedly, but God already always already did that. He had the forms of these in his mind before he had created the first man, which if you follow the, the biblical account in, in the uh, book of Genesis was Adam, and then the first woman was Eve. Well, um, on a purely philosophical level, there's this idea that there is a priority of form over matter, which it can properly be understood as originating in the mind of God, because he had a kind of knowledge which, once again, does not suffer from any privation because it is a perfect knowledge. Likewise, Phaser spends a lot of time refuting objections, dealing with things in, in, in uh, modern quantum physics, and um, largely refuting the idea that um, all of the things we just mentioned might uh, be refuted on grounds that they're in conflict with the, ex with the explanation given by physicists. He shows, however, that even if you do show from the standpoint of modern physics that, okay, I'll grant that the, the cup of coffee doesn't really exist in the way that it seems to exist when it's sitting there on your desk because the physicist would say, okay, it's not really a cup of coffee, it's a uh, particle cloud, and the reason it's not it's, the reason it's being held up by the desk is that uh, the, the, um, the particles are pushing up against each other, whatever the proper explanation given by Phaser himself within the book is. He said, okay, even if you grant that physics says that, you're acting as though it's in conflict with the explanation given by the intuitive sense, when in reality the two simply complement one another. And this is something which you would never apply as an objection to, say, a doctor who is uh, describing how um, a, a certain... Uh, surgical operation is going to fix a broken bone, for example. You wouldn't stop the doctor halfway through, interrupt him and say, oh, but wait a minute, it's not really a bone as it appears to you. It's a particle cloud. And the reason it's, um, you know, uh, going to uh, behave physically in a certain way when you're operating on it is because blah, 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 the particles are pushing up against each other, whatever. He's saying you would never do that with the doctor because you understand that, well, first of all, the, the two explanations are not in conflict one another. And second of all, the point which the doctor uh, is making would be valid even if you switch to the other interpretation. You also would never interrupt an engineer talking about the construction of a building by saying, wait a minute, the uh, floors of the building, which are not going to fall to the ground, aren't really floors as you describe them. They're particle clouds, blah, blah, blah. So the exception made to this when you're talking about um, the, the hierarchical series of um, dependencies um, as proof ultimately for the existence of God really stems more from a bias with an emotional 
origin, you don't want to accept the existence of God, and that's what leads you to have this uh, special pleading in this case, but not in the other. So there's a, a lot of other really interesting stuff he does with science, which I'll uh, refer you to the book to read. But once again, this was a lot of fun. I look forward to the next video.